afternoon, everyone. This is Jared Rand, and welcome to the Global Guided Meditation Call for Sunday, October 23, 2022, a little after 3 p.m. Eastern. When negative emotion is dissipated, our physical vehicles will vibrate in much greater harmony with nature and much disease, dis-ease, will no longer consume a man. When negative emotion is dissipated, our physical vehicles will vibrate in a much greater harmony with nature, and much dis-ease will no longer consume a man. J.J. Dewey. Our bodies are amazing healing machines. They already have automatic processes built in to them to ensure that they maintain a state of perfect health. Science has found that your body's cells naturally regenerate themselves at different speeds depending upon where they are located in the body. For instance, all of the cells in your eyes take only 48 hours to regenerate themselves whereas the cells of the liver take about six weeks to completely replicate. In one year from today, your entire body will contain 100% brand new cells where you will physically not be the same person that you are today. Now, you may be wondering, how can a person create or maintain any illness past one year if every cell in the body will be completely regenerated and brand new? Now, Dr. Deepak Chopra asked the same question and through extensive research found an amazing discovery. The reason unhealthy cells continue to replicate themselves is that negative emotions from life experiences become chemically trapped in the cell, causing it to remember itself to be unhealthy. It's very important. The reason unhealthy cells continue to replicate themselves is that negative emotions from life experiences become chemically trapped in the cell, causing it to remember itself to be unhealthy. The negative feelings in these cellular memories cause a healthy cell to replicate as unhealthy, which leads to the perpetuation of an illness or disease such as aging. Other scientists such as Candace Pert, Joseph Ledoux, and Elliot Drucker have also found that the chemicals caused by our emotions are stored within the walls of the cells. They have found that when you express positive healthy emotions, such as love, peace, and gentleness, the cell walls respond to these positive emotions and their communication receptors remain open, receptive, and healthy. On the other hand, when a traumatic event occurs, chemicals called peptides flood into our bloodstreams and attach themselves to our cell receptors, hindering chemical communication from taking place. As long as the traumatic memory from these chemically blocked cells is not healed, they end up protecting themselves and cutting off healthy, unnecessary communication with other cells in the body. Blocked communication of cells in the body eventually over time leads to the development of physical illness showing up in the body. The physical world, including our bodies, is a response of the observer. We create our bodies as we create the experience of our world, Deepak Chopra. Now, he did a, a lifetime study of successful survivors of illness. What he discovered was amazing. He found that all the survivors had two things in common. The first was that they all could access a divine, intelligent, loving source inside of them, God, higher love, infinite source, etc., whatever you wish to label it. The second thing was 
that they could forgive others. They could let go of the emotional pain and relieve themselves from their past traumatic memories. Brandon Bays, a woman who knew about the power of healing from within, cured herself of a tumor the size of a basketball by releasing and reprogramming her past stored memories. She went on to develop a simple process called the journey that allows you to access your connection to divine intelligence, reprogram cellular memories, free yourself from stored up negative emotions, and come to a true place of healing and forgiveness inside. This journey process physically supports the body in destroying peptides and reopen cell receptors for healthy cell communication. The clearing and reprogramming of these unhealthy cellular memories creates the profound effect of true physical healing all throughout the body. Every human being is the author of their own health or disease, Sevananda. Today, there are thousands of people from around the world who experience complete physical healings from this amazing journey process. Some have healed themselves from hyperthyroid conditions uh, that they've been battling for years by moving to the root of their emotional trauma and releasing it. Through a hypnosis journey inside themselves, they find the root cause of the problem, healed the memories causing the unhealthy chemicals from forming, and transformed those negative chemical patterns from within their minds. The results became a physical manifestation of a normal thyroid gland. It's important to know that people with diseases, ranging from breast cancer to poor eyesight to diabetes, have experienced total physical healing and have maintained this perfect state of wholeness to this day. A sad soul can kill you quicker than a germ. A sad soul can kill you quicker than a germ, John Steinbeck. You can heal your body with your mind. You can shift into having a physically healthier experience of life by retraining your brain to heal your body. That's where we're moving. We're moving to that. But as long as you carry trauma, as long as you carry things in that body, in that mind, past traumas, going through life, upsets, hurts, all kinds of things, your body is going to age prematurely, rapidly. In English, there is only one word for your thinking process. In English, there is only one word for your thinking process, and that is mind. And in the English language, there is no word which can denote something beyond the thinking process. The whole philosophy of Gautam Buddha and Bodhidharma is how to go beyond the thinking process. In Sanskrit and Pali, there are different words. Manas, which is the root of the English word mind, exactly means the thinking process. Then Chitta, means consciousness beyond the thinking process. What is the nature of this chatterbox mind that we have? It has been going on and on now for as long as we can remember. What are its origins? Is its source somewhere in the vast silence it dissolves into when I am in your presence. The mind is simply a biocomputer. When the child is born, he has no mind. There is no chattering going on in him. It takes almost three to four years for his mechanism to start functioning. And you will see that girls start talking earlier than boys. They are bigger chatterboxes. They have a better quality biocomputer. It needs information to be fed into it. That's why if you try to remember your life backwards, you will get stuck somewhere at the age of four. If you are a man, 
or at the age of three if you are a woman. Beyond that is a blank. You were there. Many things must have happened. Many incidents must have occurred. But there seems to be no memory having been recorded. So you cannot remember. But you can remember back to the age of four or three very clearly. The mind collects it to data from the parents, from the school, from other children, neighbors, relatives, society, churches. All around there are sources. And you must have seen little children when for the first time they start speaking. They will repeat the same word many times, the joy. A new mechanism has started functioning in them. When they can make sentences, they will make sentences so joyously again and again. When they can start asking questions, then they will ask about each and everything. They are not interested in your answers. Remember, watch a child when he asks a question. He is not interested in your answer. So please don't give him long answers with the Encyclopedia Britannica. The child is not interested in your answer. The child is simply enjoying that he can question. A new faculty has come into being in him. And this is how he goes on collecting. Then he will start reading and more words. And in this society, silence does not pay. Words pay. And the more articulate you are, the more you will be paid. What are your leaders? What are your politicians? What are your professors? What are your priests? Theologians, philosophers, condensed to one thing. They are very articulate. They know how to use words meaningfully, significantly, consistently, so that they can impress people. It is really taken note of that our whole society is dominated by verbally articulate people. They may not know anything. And I emphasize that. They may not know anything. They may not be wise. They may not even be intelligent. But one thing is certain. They know how to play with words. It is a game. And they have learned it. And it pays in respectability and money and power in every way. So everybody tries, and the mind becomes filled with many words and many thoughts. You can turn any computer on or off, but you cannot turn the mind off. The switch does not exist. There is no reference about it. And that when God made the world, when he made man, he made a switch for the mind so that you could turn it on or turn it off. There is no switch. So from birth to death, it continues. You will be surprised that the people who understand computers and who understand the human brain have a very strange idea. If we take out the brain from the skull of a human being and keep it alive mechanically, it goes on chattering in the same way. It does not matter to it that it is no longer connected to the poor person who was suffering from it. It still dreams. Now that it is connected to machines, it still dreams. It still imagines. It still fears. It still projects, hopes, tries to be this or that. And it is completely unaware that now it can do nothing. The person it used to be attached to is no longer there. You can keep this brain alive for thousands of years attached to mechanical devices. And it will go on chattering round and round. The same things, because we have not yet been able to teach it new things. Once we can teach it new things, we'll repeat new things. There is an idea prevalent in scientific circles. It is a great waste that a man like Albert Einstein dies and his brain also dies with him. If we could save the brain, implant the brain into somebody else's body, then the brain would be and go on functioning. It doesn't matter whether Albert Einstein is alive or not. 
that brain will continue to think about the theory of relativity, about stars, and about theories. The idea is, is that just as people donate blood and people donate eyes before they die, people should start donating their brains, too, so that their brains can be kept. But with the introduction of the celestial chamber, that's not necessary. Because you stay in the body for thousands of years. So there's no such thing or even a need or necessity to transplant brains into other bodies. Some idiot can be made an Albert Einstein and the idiot will never know because inside the skull of man there is no sensitivity. You can change anything and the person will never know. Just make the person unconscious and change anything you want to change in his brain. You can change the whole brain, and he will wake up with the new brain, with the new chattering, and he will not even suspect what has happened. This chattering is our education, and it is basically wrong because it teaches us only half of the process, how to use the mind. It does not teach us how to stop it so that it can relax. Because even when you are asleep, it goes on count continuing. It knows no sleep. 70 years, 80 years, it has worked continuously. If we can educate, and that's what some of us are trying to do, trying to impress upon you, that it is possible, we call it meditation. It is possible to put a switch on the mind and turn it off when it is not needed. It is helpful in two ways. It will give you peace a silence, which you have never known before, and it will give you an acquaintance of yourself, which because of the chattering mind is not possible, it has always kept you engaged. Secondly, it will give the mind rest also. And if we can give the mind rest, it will be more capable of doing things more efficiently, more intelligently. So on both sides, on the side of the mind and on the side of being, you will benefit. You just have to learn how to stop the mind from functioning and how to say to it, it is enough. Now go to sleep. I am awake. Don't be worried. Use the mind when it is needed, and then it is fresh, young, full of energy and juice then whatever you say is not just dry bones, it is full of life, full of authority, full of truth, sincerity, and has tremendous meaning. You may be using the same words, but now the mind has collected so much power by resting that each word it uses becomes a fire, becomes power. What is known in the world as charisma is nothing. It is simply a mind which knows how to relax and let energy collect. So when it speaks, it is poetry. When it speaks, it is gospel. When it speaks, it need not give any evidence or any logic, just its own energy to enough to influence people. And people have always known that there is something. Although they have never been able to exactly pinpoint what it is that they have called charisma, perhaps for the first time I may be telling you what charisma is because I knew it and know it by my own experience. A mind that is working day and night is bound to become weak, full, unimpressive, somehow dragging. At the most, it is utilitarian. You go to purchase vegetables. It is helpful. But more than that, it has no power. So millions of people, billions of people, who could have been charismatic, remain poor, unimpressive, without any authority, and without any power. 
If it is possible, and it is possible, to put the mind to silence and only use it when it is needed, then it comes with a rushing force. It has gathered so much energy that each word uttered goes directly to your heart. People think that these minds of charismatic personalities are hypnotic. They are not hypnotic. They are really so powerful, so fresh. It is always spring. That is for the mind. For the being, the silence opens up a new universe of eternity of deathlessness, of all that you can think of and deeply and eternally loving as benediction. So meditation is the essential religion, the only religion. Nothing else is needed. Everything else is non-essential ritual. Meditation is just the essence, the very essence. You cannot cut anything out of it. And it gives you both worlds. It gives you the other world, the divine, the world of godliness, and it gives you this world too. Then you are not poor. You have richness, but not of money. There are many kinds of richness. And the man who is rich because of money is the lowest as far as the categories of richness are concerned. I'll say it in this way. The man of wealth is the poorest rich man. Looked at from the side of the poor, he is the richest poor man. Looked at from the side of a creative artist, of a dancer, of a musician, of a scientist, he is the poorest rich man. And as far as the world ultimate awakening is concerned, he cannot even be called rich. Meditation will make you ultimately rich by giving you the world of your innermost being and also relatively rich because it will release your powers of mind into certain talents that you have. Many people have had experience and is that everybody is born with a certain talent and unless he or she lives that talent to its fullest. Something in them will remain missing. They will go on feeling that somehow something is not there that should be. Give the mind a rest. It needs it. And it is so simple. Just because of witness to it, become a witness to it. And it will give you both things. Slowly and slowly, slowly, the mind starts learning to be silent. And once it knows that, by being silent, it becomes powerful. Then its words are not just words. They have a validity and a richness and a quality that they never had before. So much so that they go directly, like arrows. They bypass the logical barriers and reach the very heart. Then the mind is a good servant of immense power in the hands of silence. Then the being is the master, and the master can use the mind whenever it is needed and can switch it off whenever it is not needed. The mind is always asking for more. It is a beggar. The mind is always asking for more. It is a beggar. Now, there's many ancient parables. One of them, a beggar looked on the doors of the palace. By chance, the king was just coming out for his morning walk in the garden. So he himself opened the door. The beggar said, it seems to be a fortunate day for you. The king said, for me or for you? The beggar said, by the end of the day, it will be decided. I am a beggar, and I ask only one thing. I have got this begging bowl, and you fill it up with anything you like. 
The beggar looked a little strange. His eyes were those of a mystic. His speaking was not that of a beggar, but of an emperor. His whole aura was of tremendous authority. The king ordered his prime minister to fill the beggar's bowl with gold coins so that he would remember that he had knocked on the door of a king and that he was fortunate the beggar laughed. The king said, what is the matter? He said, by the evening, everything will be decided. His behavior was strange, but very attractive, too. He was a beautiful man. And then the trouble started. As the prime minister brought a bag of gold coins to fill the bowl, they all disappeared, and the bowl remained empty. More coins, more coins. All the coins that were in the treasury were brought, and they all disappeared. The whole town gathered, and the news spread like wildfire. The king said, whatever the cause, bring all the diamonds, rubies, and emeralds, but fill the beggar's bowl. But everything disappeared. Everything disappeared in it, and the bowl remained as empty as ever. Finally, the king lost everything. It was evening. The whole day, there had been great excitement all over the capital. The king was stubborn, but now there was no point. He had nothing else to give. He fell at the feet of the beggar and asked him the secret of the bowl. Is it a magic bowl? It is evening. And you have been telling me again and again, by the evening, my sunset, by sunset, everything will be decided. Now it is time. And in a way, everything is decided. I have been defeated by a beggar. You are not an ordinary beggar. All I want to know is what the secret of this begging bowl is. The beggar said, it is not a secret. It is something everybody knows. Just look closely at the begging bowl. It is made of the skull of a man. The king said, I don't understand. The beggar said, nobody understands. Inside the skull of man is his mind. You go on pouring everything in it, and everything disappears. It is always asking for more. It is always empty. It is always a beggar. You cannot change it. You can only understand it and get rid of it. This is your situation too. You cannot satisfy yourself if you listen to the mind. If you don't listen to the mind, right. This very moment, Contentment is yours if you don't listen to the mind. You can choose between the misery of the mind because mind will always remain miserable asking for more and more and more. That desire is unending. Now, some people have rich friends. Very rich. One instance, this is a very rich man. He was not born rich. He was a poor man's son. And we were friends. And when he was a poor man's son, he was adopted by one of the richest families in India because they had no son. Suddenly, he became the richest man in India. He should have enjoyed it. He would not have been able to attain each great 
riches, even if he had worked for hundreds of lives, and suddenly he got it without any effort. But he was not happy. He wanted more. Just money was not enough. He wanted to become a great leader, too. And he had the money, so he fought the election and became a member of parliament. But that was not enough. Because of his money, he managed to become a deputy minister. But that was not enough. He told me, I want to be a cabinet minister. So I said, do you think that will be enough? He said, I think so. I said, right now, you think so. Once you become a cabinet minister, you will not think the same way. So he became a cabinet minister. And immediately when he came to see me, he said, you were right. The day I became a cabinet minister, my mind said to me, you have come a long way. Now to be the prime minister of the country is not far away. Just a few steps more, and you become the prime minister. But now I am so tense, so worried. I cannot sleep. I cannot enjoy anything. While I'm eating, I am thinking of politics. While I'm making love to my wife, I am thinking of the prime ministership. Everything has become mixed up. So he asks for help to find a sense of peace of mind. So the advice, first become the prime minister. Your mind will say, now become the president of the country. If you go on listening to the mind, you cannot have any peace. If you want peace, stop listening to the mind and drop all those things that you have obtained by listening to the mind as if and as a poor man you were so happy and so joyous you had nothing but you had a beautiful being and I'm not saying throw away your money just don't let your mind dominate you then wherever you are you will be peaceful. If your mind dominates you, even in paradise, it will say, this is paradise? There must be something more. All the houses look so old and rotten and used because they have been there for an eternity. All the people look so sad and serious, they have also been there for eternity. So much dust has gathered on them, and they have nothing to do there. They have lost their dignity. They have attained paradise, but they have lost their humanness. They cannot laugh. Laughter is prohibited in paradise, did you know? No scripture of the world, of any religion, says that humor is a religious quality. Only a few of us view it that way. Nobody is willing to allow humor and to write religiousness. What will those dead, dry-as-a-bone saints be doing in paradise? Can you even conceive? They cannot love. They cannot play cards. They cannot even have a football match. They cannot watch television. It is so unsaintly, they cannot drink even a cup of tea, no coffee, no coffee break, and no work at all. Their days are empty. Their nights are empty. They must be hankering to come back to the earth. At least here, they were worshipped as saints. There, nobody worships them because everybody is a saint. But nobody can come back from paradise. It has an entrance, but no exit. 
So before entering paradise, think twice. This is going to be the last act. Then you are finished. It is almost entering your own grave. But the mind will say, certainly, this is not paradise. Find out. Look for paradise. This seems to be some mockery. The devil seems to be behind it. It seems to be a great joke to call this paradise. Even in paradise, your mind will not allow you to have peace. Peace and the mind don't meet. It's like oil and water. One of America's very famous rabbis, Joshua Liebman, wrote a book called Peace of Mind. And the book is a great seller. So it was asked to him, whatever you know about the mind seems to be rubbish. You don't even know the that peace of mind is a contradiction of terms, and that is the title of your book. The title should be Peace or Mind. So he must have been shocked by this letter that was sent to him. He never replied. So he was written to again. This cowardliness, cowardliness, is not good on the part of a rabbi. Either change the title or give me an explanation. Neither has he changed the title, nor has he given me any explanation. So I've asked a simple thing, peace of mind. Such a thing does not exist. Either peace exists, then there is no mind, or mind exists, and there is no peace. The right title would be Peace or Mind, but he cannot change it because that is the whole theme in the book, Peace of Mind, and how to attain it. He is showing methods, ways to attain peace of mind. And the change of title will not fit with the book. He can understand that I'm putting him into a difficult situation. If he changes the title, then the book will not fit with the title. He will have to write the whole book again. And he cannot write the whole book again because he does not understand that the mind is the source of all our tensions, anxieties, and worries, and it cannot be peaceful. That cannot be. This is the whole essence of the East experiments in spirituality for thousands of years peace or mind the choice is yours peace is a very normal very ordinary very simple phenomenon and you are experiencing it but by the side the mind goes on giving a commentary there must be something more don't stop go on searching you have to say to the mind shut up It is your mind, and you have the right to tell it to shut up. That you are not going to bother about its nonsense for more and more and more. Enjoy whatever you have got. And the more you enjoy it, the more it grows. This is the paradox. The mind asks for more and more and more and becomes more and more and more worried. And without the mind, you give peace. You live love. You live silence. And by living it, it becomes more and more and deeper and deeper. Slowly, slowly, your happiness starts having wings, starts becoming a blessing, a deep eternal loving, a blissfulness, a benediction. The mind is one of the most significant things in this life but only as a servant, not as a master. The moment the mind becomes your master, then the problems arise. Then it displaces your heart, displaces your being, takes over the whole possession of you. Then, rather than following your orders, it starts ordering you. 
I'm not saying to destroy the mind. It is the most evolved phenomenon in existence. I am saying, beware that the servant does not become the master. Remember, your being comes first. Your heart comes second. Your mind comes third. That is the balanced personality of an authentic human being. Your being, the God that you are inside that body comes first. Your heart comes second, the heart mind. Your mind comes third. Mind is logic, immensely useful. And in the marketplace, you cannot exist without the mind. It's never said that you should not use your mind in the marketplace. You should use it, but you should use it. You should not be used by it. And the difference is great. It is the mind that has given you all technology, all science. But because the mind has given so much, it has claimed to be the master of your being. That's where the mischief begins. It has completely closed the doors of your heart. The heart is not useful. It has no purpose to fulfill. It is just a rose flower. The mind can give you bread, but the mind cannot give you joy. It cannot make you rejoice in life. It is very serious. It cannot even tolerate laughter. And a life without laughter has fallen below human standards. It has become subhuman. Because in the whole of existence, it is only man who is capable of laughing. Laughter indicates consciousness and its highest growth. Animals cannot laugh. Trees cannot laugh. And the people who remain engaged or encaged in the mind, the saints, the scientists, the so-called great leaders, they cannot laugh either. They are all too serious, and seriousness is a disease. It is a cancer of your soul. It is destructive. And because we're in the hands of the mind, all its creativity has gone into the service of destruction. People are dying from starvation. The mind is trying to pile up more nuclear weapons. People are hungry, and the mind is trying to reach the moon. The mind is absolutely without compassion. For compassion, for love for joy, for laughter. A heart freed from the imprisonment of the mind is needed. This is why we talk so much about heart-mindedness. The heart has a higher value. It is not of any use in the marketplace because the marketplace is not your temple. The marketplace is not your life's meaning. The marketplace is the lowest of all the activities of human beings. Man cannot live by bread alone, but mind can only provide bread. You can survive, but survival is not life. Life needs something more, a dance, a song, a joy. So it's highly recommended to put everything in its right place. The heart should be listened to first if there is any kind of conflict between the mind and the heart and any conflict between love and logic then logic cannot be decisive. Love has to be decisive. Logic cannot give you any juice. It is dry. It is good for calculations. It is good for mathematics and good for scientific technology, but it is not good for human relationships. It is not good for the growth of your inner potential. Above your heart is your being, just as the mind is logic. And the heart is love. The being is meditation. Being is to know yourself. And by knowing yourself, you know the very me meaning of existence. Knowing the being is bringing a light into the darkness of your inner world. And unless you are enlightened inside, all the light outside is of no use. Within you, there is just darkness, abysmal darkness unconsciousness and all your actions are going to arise out of that darkness out of that blindness
So if anything is said against the mind, don't misunderstand this. We are not against the mind, and we don't want you to destroy it. We want you to become an orchestra. The same musical instruments can create a hell of a noise if you don't know how to create a symphony, how to create a synthesis, how to put things in the right place. The being should be your ultimate. There is nothing beyond it. It is part of the God within you. It will give you that which neither mind can give nor the heart can give. It will give you silence. It will give you peace. It will give you serenity. It will give you blissfulness. And finally, a sense of being immortal. Knowing the being, death becomes a fiction. and Life takes wings into eternity. A man who is unaware of his own being cannot be said to be really alive. He may be a useful mechanism, a robot. Through meditation, search your being, your isness, your existence. Through love, through your heart, share your blissfulness. That's what love is all about, sharing your blissfulness, sharing your joy, sharing your dance, sharing your ecstasy. The mind has its own function in the marketplace. And what is the marketplace? The rat race. But when you come home, your mind should not continue chattering. Just as you take off your business coat, your hat, your shoes, you should say to the mind, now, be quiet. This is not your world. This is not being against the mind. In fact, this is giving the mind rest. In the home, with your wife, with your husband, with your children, with your parents, with your friends. There is no need for the mind. The need is for an overflowing heart. Unless there is love overflowing in a house, it never becomes a home. It remains a house. And if in the home you can find a few moments for meditation, for experiencing your own being, it raises the home to the highest peak of being a temple. The same house for the mind, it is only a house. For the heart, it becomes a home. For the being, it becomes a temple. The house remains the same. You go through the changes. Your vision changes. Your dimension changes. Your way of understanding and looking at things changes. And a house that is not all three is incomplete, is poor. A man that is not all three in deep harmony, the mind serving the heart, the heart serving the being, and the being belonging to the intelligence spread all over existence. People have called it God. I love to call it godliness. There is nothing above it. The mind is within all of us, but it is really a projection of the society inside you. It is not yours. No child is born with a mind. He is born with a brain. The brawn is the brain is the mechanism. The mind is the ideology. The brain is fed by the society. And every society creates a mind according to its own conditionings. That's why there are so many minds in this world. The Hindu mind is certainly separate from the Christian mind. And the communist mind is certainly separate from the Buddhist mind. But a fallacy is created in the individual that the mind is yours. So the individual starts acting according to the society, following the society, but feeling as if he is functioning on his own. This is a very cunning device. A magician, deep in the mountains, had many sheep, and to avoid servants, and to avoid looking after the sheep, and going in search of them every day when they were lost in the forest, 
he hypnotized all the sheep, telling each sheep a different story. He gave different minds to each sheep. To one he told, you are not a sheep, you are a man. So you need not be afraid that one day you will be killed. Sacrifice, like other sheep. They are only sheep. You need to be worried as far as returning home is concerned. To some he said, you are a lion, not a sheep. And to some, you are a tiger. Since that day, the magician was at ease. The sheep started behaving according to the mind that was given to them. He could kill a sheep every day. He used to kill sheep for his own food, his family's food. And the sheep who believed that they were lions or men or tigers would simply look and giggle. This is what happened to sheep. But they were not afraid, not like in the old days when he killed a sheep before. All the sheep were trembling, afraid. Tomorrow is going to be my day. How long can I live? And that's why they used to escape in the forest, to avoid the magician. But now nobody was escaping. There were tigers, there were lions, all kinds of minds had been implanted in them. Your mind is not your mind. This is something basic to be remembered. Your mind is an implantation of the society in which you have accidentally been born. You were born in a Christian home, but immediately transferred to a Mohammedan family and brought up by the Mohammedan. You would not have the same mind. You would have a totally different mind that you cannot conceive of. Bertrand Russell, one of the geniuses of our time, tried hard to get rid of the Christian mind, not because it was Christian, but simply because it was giving him, given to him by others. He wanted his own fresh outlook about things. He did not want to see things through somebody else's glasses. He wanted to come in contact with reality immediately and directly. He wanted his own mind. So it was not a question of being against the Christian mind. If he had been in Hindu, he would have done the same. If he had been Mohammedan, he would have done the same. If he had been a communist, he would have done and have done the same. The question is whether the mind is your own implanted by others. Is it your mind or is it implanted by others? Because the others implant a mind in you, which does not serve you, but serves their purposes. You are prepared by the parents, by the teachers, by the priests, by your educational system to have a certain kind of mind in your whole life. You go on living through that certain kind of mind that is a borrowed life. And that is why there is so much misery in this world, because nobody is living authentically. Nobody is living his or her own self. They are simply following orders implanted in them. Now, Bertrand Russell tried hard. He wrote a book. Why am I not a Christian? But in a letter to a friend, he wrote, although I have written the book, although I do not believe that I am a Christian, I have dropped that mind. Still, deep down, one day I asked myself, who is the greatest man in history? Rationally, I know it is, Gautam Buddha. But I could not put Gautam Buddha above Jesus Christ. That day I felt that all my efforts have been futile. I am still a Christian. I know rationally that Christ stands no comparison with Gautam Buddha. But it is only rational. Emotionally, sentimentally, I cannot put Buddha above Christ. Christ remains in my consciousness still affecting my attitudes, my approaches, my behavior. The world thinks I am no longer a Christian, but I know it seems difficult to get rid of this mind. They have cultivated it with such acumen, with such craftsmanship, and it is a long process. You never think about it. A man lives at the most 75 years on average. 
And for 25 years, he has to be in the schools, colleges, universities. One third of his life is devoted to cultivating a certain mind. Bertrand Russell failed because he had no knowledge of how to get rid of it. He was flighting and fighting, but groping in the dark. There are absolutely certain methods of meditation which can take you away from the mind, and then it is very easy if you want to drop it. But without first becoming separate from the mind, it is impossible to drop it. Who is going to drop whom? Bertrand Russell is fighting with one half of his mind against the other half, and both are Christian. It isn't doable. The society wants you simply to be a carbon copy, never an original. I'll join you in meditation, and we'll return to close this out.
Take an easy and slow breath in through the nose and an easy and slow breath out of the mouth. Remain still. The greatest spiritual energy in this entire universe is inside you, right here and now. There is nothing you can do to diminish, taint, or change this ever-present spiritual consciousness that is flowing through you. For today, imagine you have the volume control and the knowingness that you are this eternal spiritual energy. Turn up your knowingness as high as it will go. What does that feel like to know without any doubt that you are the most powerful, indestructible, eternal, infinite energy in this entire universe? Practice knowing this divine presence is you all day today. Initiate and integrate this knowingness while you work, eat, drive, play, and engage in conversation with others. Take this with you for the rest of the day, into the evening and night, and following morning. We'll return here Monday, October 24th, 2022, 3 p.m. Eastern, to continue our Global Guided Meditation Call. And be kind to yourself.